Live, people. You know what it is. Coming live, direct to you from North Hollywood, California. My name is Gil. This is the American Controller Podcast in front of a live YouTube audience. And today I got another banger for you, man. Today I've got Antonio Fernandez, better known as King Tone. He was once the leader of the New York State chapter of the almighty Latin King and Queen. Let's, uh, welcome to the podcast. What's going on, King Tone? Over here, man, staying up late for you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> man, I've been I've been hunting you down for years, Tone. You thought the feds were trying to get you. I've been trying to get you for the last two or three years, brother. I, I, you, you, I don't know, but you're in the West Coast, so... Uh... Uh, yeah, I try to keep myself. I don't do many of these outside of my own. Right. Like I see when I see somebody from the race, from the cause, you know, some my people, I, I, I do it because, you know, I, it just makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, man. And, and definitely off the back, I appreciate you agreeing to do this podcast with me and, uh, and sharing your story, my man. No problem, bro. This is what we do. That's right, Blair. So let's let's start off. First off, we're going to get a little bit of the history of the Latin Kings. Right. And then we'll go into into your history of it. And then, you know, we'll, we'll see what what comes out of this conversation. So I want to first find out is when and why did the Latin Kings actually begin? Well, you know, I, I don't like to only address it as the power group, the Latin, Latin Kings. So like I say a lot. Right. I try to get I try to be relevant to the power groups and the Latin Kings and let's say the uh, I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but what is a power group? I hear you use that phrase a lot. What exactly is so a power group? A power group is to me is like the Latin Kings when we transformed ourselves to be a political force. It's really basically saying take that uh, American label they gave us, remove it, remove the stinking thinking and the, uh, the misfit economy. That's all that makes us illegal. But the unity, this power and unity that power groups got, that gangs, that America calls gangs, that's why they made us a gang, so we could be illegal. Because if we're a power group, like their forefathers were when they did the Boston Tea Party, if the king would have considered them a gang, George Washington would have never existed. Yes, sir. So, so what I'm saying is the Latin Kings is dear to my heart and is who made King Tone and and who helped him find his way out of addiction. So they're like every power group that was created in the 60s, in the, in the movement of fighting for our rights, the brown, the black, the Native American, the Martin Luther Kings, the Malcolm X, the Lolita Labrons, the Oscars, and all, you know, you know, like just out La Wabana, right? We, we got a lot of heroes. The Mexicans got their heroes who fought for their freedoms, right? That's why we celebrate Cinco de Mayo. But really, are we free, right? So what I'm saying is the king started recognizing that if they learned their past history and held true to why we were formed to be a power group, to stand our ground and protect our community and do it in the form that we were really created under the oppression that we felt from the Irish, from the Italian, from all those other groups that already had a piece of the pie. And uh, we, we stood up. And we stood with that movement and the Young Lords were created and then the Black Panthers came along and the MOVE movement was created. So what I'm saying, these are all fruits of oppression where young adults started standing up and speaking out and the Latin Kings was one of them groups. And uh, from Chicago was brought over to New York and in New York, we started following those beliefs that we are a guiding light to all those who are oppressed, that we shouldn't become oppressors that we are representative of the third world. You know, we got a beautiful literature that taught us to understand how to be, you know, civil civilians, but in a society that accepts us. So with that, that's who the kings are, you know. And today, of course, like many of the power groups, we lost our way and we found ourselves so oppressed, we started mimicking the oppressor. And right now, that's why you see the brown on brown, the black on black, the oppressed killing each other and fighting with these guns in the street is that loss of identity. And uh, so the first thing we got to do is, is stop teaching our kids those white lies and re-educate them with a knowledge and truth about who they are, where they come from. And that's when I believe all power groups and, and public safety factor comes along. Because when somebody really finds who they are, they really try to live up to a different expectation than a one who don't know who he is and is seeking and letting anybody lead him to believe who he is, right? right. So that's the war for our guys. 
is to bring them back, reteach them, re-empower them, and understand that we're not against the unity. We're against the stinking thinking and bringing oppression to their own. Right. Now let's, so, but the, the Kings originally, Latin Kings originally started up in Chicago, right? Yeah, they, that's where it started in, in the 60s. And like I said, then it came over to New York in like in the 80s. How, how did and, it come over to New York? Huh? How did it come over to New York? Like, like, like when you, like anything, and when you don't got a job in a California, you drive your ass to New York. <laughs> when you ain't got shit to do in Chicago, you get in the bus and you go to the big city. Right. Or when you get in trouble in New York, you send your ass to PA. You know what I'm saying? So it's a natural, it's a natural existence that when you're a Cuban and you really didn't have nothing, and and and, and the one who brought it to New York, you know, was a Cuban or Marielito who really never had family and everything. He was seeking that, which what you know everybody say, oh, gangs of kids who, who are seeking family. So, uh, but that's when he brought it to us and we endeared it because we were being oppressed. And we're speaking about Luis Felipe, right? Yes, Luis Felipe. And uh, so he, we were oppressed because we were the Puerto Ricans, right? We still didn't understand the black and white war and the movement and the freedom fighters because we were trying to find our own. And you see that a lot in the Latino kids when we were coming up. We knew everyone's heroes, but our own. Right. So when we started discovering that we had heroes, we wanted something to represent a banner to represent and something that united us. And that's what we found. That was my Boy Scouts. That was my boys club. None of them suckers were coming around to East New York. I ain't never seen that bucket. So I, I went with the one that was there for me. That was the community who accepted me at my worst mistakes, at my worst place and try to build me up. So that's what it really was formed for. And that's where I came to New York, just like oh. it was. How was your how was your childhood actually? Where were you? Where were you actually I, got no sisters. Uh, I got no brothers. My mother and father, thank God, they're still alive. You know, they're old. They've been married. I'm, I'm so I'm 55. I have five, four sisters older than me. I never had another. I never seen a broken home. I never. My father never got arrested in his life. He visited jail once to see Mike. So, what I'm saying is that broken home. It's either way, man. If you got a father in your house and welfare tells you to help you pay the rent, your mother got to say that he ain't there. Oppression. Yeah. He feel like a sucker now. Yeah. So if you have no father and you get in welfare, you get my point. So that shit don't matter. When you walk out the door, you can have 10 fathers, an uncle, a cousin. Ain't nobody out there to be your big brother and to show you and tell you by experience, because your father got to work, your mother got to work just to pay the rent. So who's raising you? Your oldest brother, <laughs> your oldest sister. So what I'm just saying is, I had a good family. None of them ever got in trouble, none of them but me. And then of course, you know, I, I broke that, I broke that. I just, I didn't like being poor. I didn't understand what all the values my father had and my mother gave when they came here and were good citizens, good people, the embarrassment and the belittlement the system put them through. So I said, fuck that, not me, <laughs> not me. I'm tired of white people calling me dummy, you fucking spick, you can't do this, you can't do that. So I just got frustrated in third grade and call it quits with the American dream and started the 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 tone dream. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how was, uh, how was your experience in the New York school system? It sucked. So we will have 30, 40 kids in the class. We will have teachers being coming outside of our neighborhood that didn't understand Spanish. So you ended up in a bilingual cash or special ed class. Cause that's what black and brown kids are. When we learn slower than other, we're special. We need to be put in spec. Then they were doing that. So I dropped out in third grade and I made it all the way to ninth. They were doing grad. You were, you didn't have to go to school for five days and you were going to get passed. They saying to me, they didn't care if I know how to spell my name. It mm. took a, a person and, and I say she was a white old lady out ninth grade. She told me to do a couple of basic things and I didn't know how to do them. And she said, you don't know how to write. I said, thanks for caring. <laughs> but I had a pack full of hundreds already. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, that covered the reality that I was powerless, right? And that all that injury from third grade up, I was storing it by getting my 
thrill of saying I made it by becoming a capitalistic pig with no fucking values, pushing in the high school, making them pay for what the fuck they did to my mom and my dad. You know what I mean? All right, all of you are going to feel this now. And I'm going to get rich off of it, right? So that's when you lose your values. But my family never lost their values. I did. You get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So did you grow up uh, like praising criminals, praising gang members? How was your neighborhood where you grew up? Where exactly did you grow up at also? Fuck, I got to look at my neighborhood shit. I love all the fuck. I love Muggsy. I love the, 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 the outsiders. I loved all the American gangs they were pushing on me. <laughs> Fuck, I'm gonna look outside. First gangster I ever seen was on TV. He Sir. had blue eyes. He ain't never been a black man. I ain't lying. You ain't lying. And that made me say, oh, so those are the dudes who are doing it. Remember when they had Al Capone and Nitty fighting? They had the black and white show. That shit used to get, oh, look at them. Oh, they busted that shit. <laughs> when they did the provision and there wasn't liquor. See, they think I'm an idiot or I didn't see black and white. So I used to watch Betty White, Betty White movies. So I know when my little man was standing on the, on the fucking tanks burning saying, Mom, I made it to the top of the world. I said, this is my nigga right here. Yeah. Yes. So what I'm saying is, ain't nobody taught me about gangsters but America. Mm, that's deep, brother. And they, and they continue to do so today? Yeah, now on Discovery, they rather show people in jail putting shit in fighting. They rather show all this shit than a lion in a lion is having sex like they used to. Yeah. That shit don't sell no more. So what they turned, they went to the animals they created in cages. Mm. American gangster. And then they put a gangster up there and they sensationalize a murder and they take kids that we would have never heard about, made them special. So know that that gang gets about 100 recruitments after they see that shit on TV. Yes, the sir. whole neighborhood is knocking on their door. Yes. That's done by purpose, a purpose to mislead. So all I'm saying, I'm keeping up. Now, when I went to the street, because what I see on TV, I knew how to deal with them fucking gangsters. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I knew how to be a gangster. You know, John Wayne taught me with all his little bullshit. I just watched them real good, you know what I mean? I loved the gun players since a kid, and I always loved the Indians, right? And I always loved everybody that got beat up. So what I'm saying is it was in my nature to look at the gangster because I quit on education in third grade. So the other thing I've seen that made it in America, you with an education, you became like my father, you get a job, you don't think about college. All that shit looked scary to me. I said, let me get mine now. So. Really, that's where I learned about gangs. Now, when I went in my hood, my gangsters were different than the ones I've seen in TV. In TV, the white gangs to kill each other like dogs. The real first veterans who came from the Vietnam War when the heroin hit, and when they started flooding our streets with cocaine, we know about Reagan. Even though we were drug dealers, man, we used to feed each other. The numeritos, every hustle we had in the hood helped the hood. Like Lado now, they stole it from the Spanish people. Those were the bolitas, <laughs> right? Yes, they sir. stole the marijuana from us. Now it's in Denver. They, they call it illegal until they get about 2 million of us in cages. Then all of a sudden, they add taxes to it and somebody owns the business. It ain't, ain't us. They're making money. I continue to show you what I became was a capitalistic. I was a CEO. I was going to start creating brands with what they put in my neighborhood. And I was gonna get mine, but I always was a conscience loving gangster because my father taught me values. My mother loved me. So I didn't have to kill a Puerto Rican to get mine. I outthought him, I out hustled him, and I might have pushed him a little, but I have to kill a Puerto Rican to get rich. That shit was everywhere. You know? Sir, how were the how were the cops uh back in New York? Because I've seen on documentaries on TV that you had a lot of corruption going out there. Was that the case? Yeah, so if you go if you go back and you go to Netflix or um, HBO, excuse me, they did a special on called the 75th Precinct. I saw that. Well, that's the precinct two blocks from my house. <laughs> Shit. I used to give them niggas drugs. They used to tell me what they did it to all of us. What I'm saying is the streets were the precinct was the lighthouse. 
Mm. They used to tell us who can make it or not. You ever heard of Larry Davis? My lawyer, Ron Kuby, represented him. Absolutely. It was about detectives who used to use him to hit spots. Then they showed up in his house because he knew too much. And he started blasting them like ziggity zam, blah, 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 blah. Because he knew they wasn't coming for justice. Right. So in those days, Fort Apache, the, 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 listen, the cops came from uh, other places. The French connection. You look at all of that. The police was just as corrupt as the Republican Party today saying that there wasn't an insurrection. That was the police station then. The reality and truth wasn't real. All they had to do was get rid of these niggas and spits. And if you don't like me using the word, then you should tell your police department to stop using it till it uses it to this day with their own members who got badges. And I'm not trying to be crucial, but that's all I heard my whole life. You do your thing, Tony. You do your thing, player. But so with that, I'm just saying, so the cops, the blue wall of silence is the same one as today. Right. The dudes that train them is the dudes. Some, some of them dudes are in wheelchairs, bro. Them, so that means the traditions of yesterday yes. are still part of today. And until we, that's who the precinct is, right? It's a representation of a police force that thinks it isn't empowered by the people, that they're here to police their people, right? And that's the step, that's, in those days it was a lot harder. So, you know, you had to deal with cops, like you tell with your man, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> you, know, you only could trust them as far as you could throw them, you know what I'm saying? So talk to me about your hustling days. When, when did you start selling drugs? How long did that go for for you? Well, I started probably right right there. I was running with the guys since third grade and bringing back and forth as a runner, just bringing the package. And then, you know, I graduated. Then I opened a, we opened a weed spot. Then the Jamaicans came, so we had to fight the Jamaicans. Then the Dominicans came, then we had to fight the Dominicans. Then the Cubans came, we had to fight the Cubans. Because that's the hood, right? If you yeah. got the cocaine, then they bring another, the Jamaicans, they're going to make cocaine. So there they got, we got a little conflict, but then we became brothers and we learned to share in that economy. And then I just moved up. So when I got in the heroin game with my partners, he's probably watching the show, my man Celsa, and we opened something called COD, Cash on Delivery. And uh, already by 16, me and my team, boy, yeah, dudes don't know. It ain't that box, that shoe box money we were talking about then. Heroin was the world then, as you know. A lot of veterans were using it. The streets was on it. And, but like I said, what it really did to keep it 100, my heroin deal, dealing was when I finally, and you know, making it that high, it was when I was the saddest in my life because I see my mother's face. I did this all two, two houses from my mother's house. <laughs> so, you know, it, it wasn't like far. When I flipped, I flipped, you know what I'm saying? But the point is, I finally, I felt so guilty that I was too much of a coward to kill myself. Mm. So I started using the product. And when I used the product, I found that I became invisible. And when you're invisible, it's better than being the boogeyman. So I learned a, a gray spot where I just started punishing myself with cocaine, with, with, then it was base that led to crack. And then I said, why don't I rob the bad guys? So me and my merry men started robbing drug dealers, you know? And that became our norm, and that's a dangerous life. You know what I'm saying? So through all that, I found myself in prison because of me trying to get rid of me. And then uh, that's in, uh, the, my first one was like in 84 when I tried to hurt a kid. But when I went in drug deals, I was already close to 19 and, uh, I had a lot of open cases and uh, I went, I went away, you know, I went into the island and I started to learn uh, what, what jail is really about. You know, it wasn't a scare, but I was, I had too many things going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, my addiction and selling drugs was one of the most miserable things I found I did, you know what I mean? To my community. And I regret it to this day. How was Rikers Island back in those days? So let me, like, Rockers Island in those days, you see how I am, my jewelry? Yeah. 
you could wear your jewelry. You could have your New York clothes. Every Wednesday, your girlfriend could bring your clothes ironed in a bag. The phone was on the wall and it was direct. It wasn't a machine. So if you, you so the strongest survive. If you grab the phone and you could hold it for eight hours, you keep it eight hours. Shit. And if you could bring clothes ironed, imagine what you could bring in the, you get what I'm saying? Sure. So it was New York, but captured the worst of the worst. And then we had to make it with each other because we wasn't sentenced. So we were pre-sentenced. So we had all the rights. We had to have some rights there, right? right? So they changed all that shit. But that's when I came up. When you could see a dude with 15,000 in his pocket, bigger change than mine, and he's going to the mess hall. <laughs> wow. And you, you know, a lot of you talk, but today they changed the jail on you. You really had to make it. You know, you really. So anyway, when I seen that, it was like I became, I started robbing dudes in there. And uh, I remember in C-76, me and my man Bamboo and Chino, we, we do clothes. So we used to scare the dudes. Yo, you go in there, it's tough. Why don't you put your, your chain, your, 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 your pumps, your Reebok pumps, your Casio watch, put in your socks. Soon as the dude do it, we seen he gave in. When I throw it down the chute, yo, it's in the socks. <laughs> Problem. Then we wear their shit to the mess hall. So what do you think happened? Uh, I'm not trying to sound tough. What do you think happened? Them dudes were mad as fuck. Yeah, fuck yeah. So they got me. They cut me. You know I'm, what I'm saying? You got to give it and take it. Like a man, ain't nobody sending me money shit. I uh, don't burn my family. I burned the drug dealers in my hood. So <laughs> what the fuck I'm going to do, right? So anyway, I'm just showing you the belittle that we do to each other. So I was also in a jail named C95 in Rockers Island where they would give people that were addicted 100 milligrams of methadone. If you're too young, you take 100 milligrams of methadone, call it quits. You die. So why used to, me and my team, used to scare those drug de those drug addicts, then we call it spit back. You want to learn, you want to brag about jail? Want to see how nasty we could become? And I used to hold their mouth and make it spit it in a fucking cup. And I used to add Kool-Aid. And I used to sell it for three crates of Newport. While I seen a man squirm because he didn't have his medicine that night. I might have gave him his shit the next day. Y'all want to play with this shit? You think I changed because this shit was fun? You, I, y'all think it's a game. Do you have to go make a man spit his shit in a cup and you got to mix it with Kool-Aid and see a nigga that call himself cool, drink a man's spit. Ugh. Huh? And those were the cool dudes who were doing it. Uh, and I used to giggle. <laughs> See, well, I'm, a lot of people don't talk about this part. I'm not bragging. That's a savage. I'm a savage. See, the sick and the dude drinking it is a, is not cool and he ain't a gangster. You're an addict if you drink another man's spit. Sir. But these are the dudes who call us and give us orders in the street. To our thirteen-year-olds, the fuck out of here! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, when did you actually? Because I know you went into jail again. I don't know if it was Rikers Island, and that's when you, the Latin King kind of started coming into your life, right? I was like that, and I was gonna start a racial war, and an elder pulled me in, and he took that anger you see, and all that animalistic shit I was doing. And he, 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 he called me stupid. <laughs> Ain't nothing good like the truth to hear you. He said, you stupid. You get on the phone and you ain't calling nobody because I don't hear you. And nobody's talking to your dumb ass. So why don't you take that time and lock in and learn how to read? And I got these two brothers that are tutors. Because you keep it real. You keep it real fucking stupid, he used to tell me. You're always in trouble. So he just, I love him to death. He, King Mafia took me and they, 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 I learned how to read. Then I started getting, once I learned how to read, they had problems. Then they, I still struggle with writing, but then they taught me how to write. 
And then they taught me how to get my values back <clears throat> and learn of heroes that did great things from Puerto Rico and Dominica and Avisu Campo and all those people that made me who I was today and where my bloodline truly came from. And finding myself, when I came home in 92, it was a problem because I had, I had a power group. We were still this thinking, thinking. I had knowledge and then they saved me from myself. So when I came home, I had a big debt to give back to the crown and the nation. And to this day, that's why I don't denounce them because they never made me do anything I didn't want to do. They, I was already bad when they found me. Yes. So what I'm saying, so today I give always back in my messages and my love. And when people see me, I want, I, I want them to say, that's a good king. Like you say, that's a good Muslim. That's a good Christians. Because there's a lot of piece of shit within our own organizations, like in the police force. And if we're going to be real about ourselves, when we talk to evil and bad and misjustice, you know, I got, if I'm going to talk it about it in your mob, I better talk to mine first. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I never deep. So that's the point. I don't try to show people that I believe they're their worst mistakes. They're their worst crimes that they're committing right now. I see them where I'm at. And I know the road is long, but an old dude told me the victory is certain, right? If you just put your work in and you start learning from your mistakes. So that's what, that's what it did. And that's what the nation did for me. And it got me to the platform when I came home that I started doing my actions with the group and I got good leaders behind me and, and, and I started articulating what would it take to transform us into that thing that we always wanted to be, a lighthouse for our community. Now, if you would touch on Amor de Rey, what does that mean to you guys when you say that to one another? It means like when a Christian says hallelujah or amen. It means like when you say hello. It means like when a Muslim tells another Muslim, you know, Ale al -Akbar, or when you say, um, I'm just saying, we all got our greetings. We all got that. They just sensationalize our gangs because we have to be criminalized. That ain't what makes us bad. That shit is sweet. That's a lot sweeter, I think, than amen. Or going, why? I'm on the rain. That's, don't get mad at us because that one's sexier than yours. That's what I'm saying. I, Yo, I used to go in the morning to my mailroom job when I was in New York and I was in, in the Latin Kings. I always had a job. And I remember I used to see all kinds of religions and all kinds of people on the pack A train. Boy, but let a Latin King walk up in there and let him see that you a Latin King. Niggas used to blush because we'll walk through everybody. We'll touch each other. We'll hug each other. And we'll start talking and they're all looking at us like, like we are known. Now that's my brother. Fuck it out our way. Hey, I'm on the way. Do I'm here? What's up? Let's talk. And to people that was scary, but I thought that's what Christians should do, right? Be proud, be loud, but don't be obnoxious, right? right. Don't. And that's all I'm saying. That to us was just the greeting where we, when we see each other, it's known. I'm on the way. I'm here. I'm on the way. I'm here. And you sit your ass down and chill. We, it don't make we break out guns and start shooting up the train. Wrong neighborhood, wrong gang, wrong color dude. That's so, on the other side of the suburbs where they get guns and they just shoot up trains and Walmarts. You know, we got targets. We got enemies in our minds. So different kind of anger, right? Different kind of. So what, that's all I'm saying. I'm all that raise a simple hello. We love you. And, and you know, we're here. So. Walk me through the steps so you get out the joint or the or Rikers Island. And then uh, how do you go about eventually being crowned the leader of the Latin Kings? How does that work? Well, I never crowned the leader. Uh, and that's, you know, it's we, we're, we're more democracy than most of these democracies they claim in this country. Every okay. leader in our place is voted by the people and placed. And as you do your action in your place, you gain that respect where... Like anything, you get voted to higher offices. All that shit you gotta do come play, that's for savages. Why can't you think of, we think about better? That's just what you made us turn into and you made us believe that was power. But I was very much, and my, my organization was built on a thinking man. There is no room in our nation for a dumb man. 
So we must teach each other because we're strong as our weakest link. So we taught our people how to pick their leaders by their actions, their words, and what they represent and did for them. And that's how we did it. So that just meant that I did a lot of work to unite the people where I was recognized and they said, hey, would you like this post? And, and, and you've earned this spot. And at first I didn't take it, but then like everything else, you know, when you're needed and you're called, if you don't take it, you can't get mad when a bad man takes it. So when I seen that I had the opportunity for the first time to in a bigger scale with the blessings of those that 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 did a big mis you know that were accused and took it away from me i thought that me and the generation they live right behind them could learn from what happened and then we could took the nation to that place where we became community activists again and started building the trust of the community to believe in us again so what, what year did you actually get voted in now i've been in the nation but in 95 is really when the movement started and, and when you came in, did you come in there with that thinking? Because I had never seen anything like that before in my life, especially from a gang member. You came in there with a certain structure that has never been seen before. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I read books. I was taught by good elders. I talked, of course, a lot of people may not agree, you know, whatever. Luis Felipe is a very wise and smart man, you know. he's Cubans are... If you, Cubans are smart people, man. If you ever debate a Cuban, you might as well call it a rap. You ain't going home, bro, because they're very intelligent and they, they're fed them. But what I'm saying is we got to we gotta study and we got to know ourselves. So I, got, I just reached the plateau, but I wasn't alone. So that was my point. So I came with the idea that I, I had an idea. I, the, the highest finally bought, you know, bought in with it. Now I had to give it to the people in a way they would like it and understand it. And again, the best way to do that is not to become an American gangster but to give the people the leaders they call for and then give them the right and the safe spaces to speak and then take them out of parks and out of the dark and put them in lighthouses like St. Mary's Church where you see a lot of the videos where Luis Barrios took us and Father Barrios started accepting us, which connected us with Dave Brotherton, which gave us the college John Jay, which led to Richie Perez who ran the Puerto Rican the Puerto Rican rights, he's like young lord. And then, which let you see, then the outside influences as I taught them to trust each other. And that there was nothing to hide, but of what? Our stinking thinking. Our literature ain't shameful. The way we say hello is in a shame way. It's the what we were doing to earn our daily bread because we come from an oppressed place. So what happens if we take dope and replace it with hope? You take yourself and take miseducation and misinformation with proper education, self-termination, and then a cause that we could all agree on to do what? An action, which was to start marching against police. So if motherfuckers think I just, I'm a dummy, you got me fucked up. If you think it just happened by a miracle, you got me fucked up. Not because me, because then you're insulting the people who raised me. My mother and father gave me morals, gave me Jesus, gave me all those nice things. The streets gave me cojones. The brothers gave me my humanity back. And then I got a cause. I wanted to save my people. Like I was saved from addiction, from stinking. So anyway, we got a good group of leaders that were chosen and we started having safe spaces and we had other people who told us like, Richie, this is how you organize. This is how you make a newsletter. This is how you get your economy to self-sustain. This is how you make t-shirts and sell to feed each other. This is how you let us help you. This is how you protest guns in school. And then what? And then I had Marines, then I had, we knew how to do left flank, right flank, about face. Don't get me twisted because I knew that if you inspire people to march and to let their voices be heard against the enemy, you also got to teach them the line that they could storm the Capitol, but the land kings can't. They would murder us like they did the brothers in Attica they when would. they stood up to get pencils and so we could get haircuts. Attica is a jail upstate, New York. Read about it. If you never read about it, 
you ain't really know your history. They sent the National Guard to shoot them men in the yard. They slit other CO's throats to make it look like it was the prisoners because they wanted pencils and pen and paper. How did how did uh, the group of young men that were from the Latin Kings take to your message of peace, of not selling drugs, of kind of because those guys at the time were. If you take, if you tell me, right? If you tell me, give me, give me a gun. Give me your gun. Give me a job. Give me your dope. Give me education. You can't take something and leave the hands empty. So that's what America likes doing. They sell promises. They make contracts. They do all that shit, and it could change in a day. My point, they did it to the Indians. They gave them land, reservation caps, right? Trail of tears. It was all a lie. So what I'm just trying to teach you, man, that that's what I taught my nation. I said, we don't got what we need, but what we don't need is what we got. And that is us using things that are short-term remedies to get the money which leaves our wives alone, leaves our kids alone. We keep going back to jail. So we must fight to get this straight economy. We must challenge Giuliani, that crook, that robber. He was one then, he's one now, and it's proven. So that's the dude I fought. And everybody said, oh, he's righteous. He, all you suckers that thought that man was righteous, come to me and say sorry. <laughs> because I knew from the beginning, when I asked them for jobs for my guys, trainings, and we took an abandoned school and we fixed it and did dance classes. And we were trying to do everything right without money, without a budget. That 90% of you nonprofit organizations with big names and all this shit that you doing today, I did it with Beepers. I did it with zero dollars. 2,000. You can't get 10 kids in your room, suckers. And we're giving you millions. And you don't let me live now, right? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not evidence-based. Fuck, when I did this, you wasn't around. And me and my team replaced that. They started believing little was better than a lot bad more. We started looking up to the workers and the fathers in the nation, not the pushers. We didn't look down on them, but they couldn't leave because it gave a bad example to the younger. We stopped letting our kids fly colors in school because school wasn't a bang, it was to learn. We started talking to the Zulu nation, other gangs, and telling them, how can we make it a safe space? How can we stop selling dope on the park where we play? Why don't we take it to the garment district or to the place where the buildings and they doing their material and textile Ain't nobody there. Let's push it in front of their businesses. You ain't gonna stop. At least stop doing it in your own, on your grandmother's porch. So then what we gave, we gave reason and people started listening. We, we united this thing called the United Families Coalition that was invented by my leaders. And in our Sharpton's office, every month, me and the power groups used to meet, see, under Giuliani's ass without him knowing it, and we used to formulate how we were gonna disarm and keep our guys from fighting because we drew respect lines. We learned to respect one each other, even though we had differences. We learned that just because we see each other doesn't mean we gotta act a fool. And crime went down. We started fighting, stopping frisk, and we started defending the mothers against police brutality. Miss Bias, whose son, was killed in a chokehold because his football hit a police car. We did the Rosarios, who three sons, cops were selling these, these married with Dominicans license. And then when they found out these kids wanted their money, they went to the setup house, set them up and shot three, two brothers and a cousin over 32 times. The two brothers died, the cousin lived. We had 33 stories like that, that because politicians, the church, Nobody wanted to stand with them. They came to the bad guy. And for the first time, we really had all the power groups that we formed and were fighting so hard. We found the perfect cause to bring the light 
to the change we were trying to bring. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about the dark side of what happened to you. You got caught eventually in some type of drug sale that sent you to a federal prison for 15 years. The dark side, you know, it was called the dark side. Damn, I was, it, I was getting it, nervous. I said, oh, shit, you got dark side <laughs> you it's the dark side. Because a lot of people that doubted you used that as the cloud over you to say, see, this guy was fucking lying. Yeah, so, nah, I did what I did, but let's know the story because people see HBO and they think they know me. Okay. Then people also judge people off what comes out in the media and everything. They don't believe the media for some things until they talk to about a Puerto Rican and a black man. Then they write the truth. But when they write about a white man, it's a lie. You got to check it. Or they write about a lawyer, you got to check it until they write about Tony. It's the truth, right? But with that, I'm saying this. I always had a job and they could record it. Always kept the job when I was a leader of the king. Then the feds came for me. I became the number one man wanted in New York without a car, without able to even travel to each borough without reporting to a police, living in a small apartment, making 35,000 a year, working in a mail room. And when they came and made me their objective, they went to my job and they started chasing everything that I held dear as a legal job and a legal identity, which led me moving my, my, my family, which at that time was my first daughter, jumping the brothers know from house to house. Make, no one, I couldn't make a living, but, and I couldn't use my people's money for my living. Got two choices now. And I want to change and I'm fighting and I'm not, and then it, it came to the boil that Rent was due for three, four months. I was running. See, and you would say, damn, Tom, fuck. How could you owe that if you got these six, 5,000 people? Because a motherfucker never robbed nothing for me. A motherfucker never sold nothing for me in the nation. That ain't me. So when I was fucked up, guess who did it? Me. I ain't call my junior to rob somebody. I didn't call nothing. I was ashamed to ask all the people who were helping me and believed in me because that Puerto Rican pride, I couldn't say, yo, I need $7,000 to pay the back rent or they're going to kick me and my family out of our project. So I trusted one man and I let him do something in my house. That's all you seen was after fact. All I did was sit and let him back, son. And then they set me up with the view, and he was already a cooperating. And that's when I found out four years later, because they didn't arrest me immediately. They went, followed me four more years to catch me doing bigger things. But like I said, that's not what I did, because that's the way I live. I went back to what I knew how to do fast to save myself out of a situation. If I had to do it all over again, I would have done the 20 years in a shelter with my kids. I would have been fucking hungry in the street like they wanted me, then did that mistake. So, you know, any punk ass nigga could be a quarterback on Monday. I did it when I had to do it, when I thought. Now I knew after I got arrested and I had almost a million dollar bail and the community put up 120 thousand dollars cash to bring me home i said shit all i needed was seven <laughs> shit. so then i found out that i had millions of dollars because people love me but i was too ashamed to ask a gangster's death his pride yeah he kills for it he fights over it he he, he leaves his family over it he stuck on pride like a cross, like Jesus on the cross when they had him. Sir. So I learned to put that shit aside. Tone's pride. Fuck, I gotta show anybody what I'm what I'm proud about is that I realized that I did a mistake. So when I went in front of the judge, it is in the menace. 
I said, you see the 300, 400 people there and all that? That's not why I'm here. I'm here because I was selfish and I did a sale to do what I had to do. You see my family. But point is, the Kings ain't never do nothing but good for me. And this is two different things. And the judge agreed with me. She said, you a dummy. You a lookout. Why you with the boss, you dumbass? So for that, I'm going to give you 15, not 18. Because I've looked, she said, and looked and looked. And even with the 130 people they picked up with you and everything you did, there was not one murder. There was no guns. We were, you, you trampled us. So you were getting there, stupid. That's why you here. So I learned right today that you can't live two lives. Yes, sir. If you're going to go, that's why I say I'm relevant, but not involved in the gang. Cause those dudes in the middle, usually the ones who die quick. So I try to bring a message of hope and love to the gang, but I'm never going to lead or be the leader. My day has passed, but there's a leader in the language. There's a leader in the crib. There's somebody who dreams just like me to not be scared that all his homies don't have to shoot each other, but too scared to talk. Cause that's some idiot that doesn't let that light shine in that circle. So that's what I did, brother. I, I just, that's what I fight right now. That ignorance and that pride and that Latino machismo. You Cholos got it. Low riders got it. It's the same pride in the West, like it's in the East and in the Midwest. We need to put that aside. There's a proper pride. And then there's, there's the destructive thing about we as men can accept that other men got the right to breathe, to raise their kids, to say no to that gangster image, to not want to go to jail. Like that shit is some sucker shit. No, you the sucker shit seen slinging dicks all day. Fuck that. Freedom ain't overrated. Yes, I'm staying the fuck home as much as I can. <laughs> that shit ain't cool no more so for the youngsters who are struggling and don't know it even though we try to share it as power group leaders and the new unity we got and we're trying to bring in this positive message we don't down them we understand where they at but we also protect them against the system that put them there with the negligence with the non not the non-education and the real things they need to make it through these hard neighborhoods that are historically been neglected by our government. Sir. So I, I want to find out why is it you got sentenced to 15 years, correct? Yeah. Why is it that they put you in isolation for uh for three years of that first? So you know when you learn, like if you're little Wayne or you anybody, if you're a star, the first thing you go into the shoe, like six nine, right? That's the first <laughs> flavor. That's New York. Wait, but they want to see if you're six nine on a nigga. So okay. the shoe, if you're a big name, the goddies in us, that's our first. You don't think you don't think it, but that's how they teach you. Oh, you a boss? This is what bosses get. <laughs> Shit. So then I'm not only got 15 in the point system, I was in a camp status. But because I led people, they put that I was a danger. I got the shots downstairs. I was a danger to the running of an institution. I was a danger to the power groups and I was a danger to myself. So no warden, I used to fly every three months to new prisons while wardens used to wave, take that asshole out of here. We don't want him here. And I never cut nobody. I never, it was people like me. I'm not the only one in the feds that are known as activists. That's your life because they know you know how to unite the people. So if you got one CO, watching 150 men and my little stupid ass starts that no justice, no peace and start telling them how are we being watched by one man, right? And why are we beating up each other for a TV when he could turn it off? See, I turned the tables on them. And so they keep me locked up. But uh, that shit wasn't funny either. You know, I, I started learning, but really it was the best thing that happened to me because is where I questioned my foundation again. Because I said, if you were doing all that good, you sure as hell ended up real bad. So that meant there were still things within myself I had to fix. And to everybody who judged me, I was never perfect. 
Nobody took me to a fucking Ivy League school in Harvard and taught me how to lead. Nobody gave me a map how to do what I did. I did that shit with my men's on the run. <laughs> we did that shit in a little table with queens and people who had a ninth grade education. We were shaking the city. So that, that that's how I believe, man. Something authentic, something by the people, something that uh, these kids see that's based on love. Man, right now I walk into nanny hood, man. I, if I was if I was gangster enough to die for a lot of stupid shit, how much further I'm willing to go for a young girl or a young soul that I want to bring out that darkness, right? So that's the dark side of me now. These dudes who think, because they're that, they're that dude that there isn't light that's, that's got the cojones to go in the dark, right? Then I'll bring him to the pastor so he could get his 10% after I get him all fixed and he's all nice. Then the pastor could keep him. But his ass ain't going to go out there and get him. That's a scary world out there. You know what I mean? So that's what I do now, man. I, I try to pr tell the, 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 the power groups and the community and the government, how do we come to a table and realize that it's going to take all of us to re-empower the community with resources, not police precincts, not probation officers, but authentic leaders with authentic ideas to start to learn to create their own safe spaces in the parks we took from our kids and the, the after school programs we defunded. Our kids are there because we put them there. What, what would you say to any youngster thinking that he's gonna go to the shoe and he's gonna be a superstar, he's gonna go to prison, it's gonna be all glamor like they see on TV? What would you say that life is really about in there? Well, if you're ready to, uh... So first thing when you go to the shoe and you meet, you got to let everybody know you there. Then it, you got 30 days to bring your paperwork like this. And you got to give it to another man. And if your paperwork is 6'9", run like hell. Run like the devil. They're going to eat your ass. They're going to just stab you up. I'm just going to talk reality. That's right. Even if you're in the shoe. Then after you get that process off, no matter how big you are, the name you are, they going to want to see that black and white, son. And then after that, I have to empty out my toilet with a cup. Clean it with a rag. Because I got a little note saying we got the toilets clear so you could talk to us through the toilet phone. So nobody shit. So you won't hear the running water and the turd going by your conversation. It's like getting a fucking, you know, when you talk to somebody and your phone, now your new phone, it gives you the, the, the hey, you got a text? Well, we knew when they, you think it's funny. So you talk. It's happening today with I got, and I'm not doing it to belittle them. Y'all want to go there? That's going to be your phone, sucker. And when it's dark and dim like me now, when I see the sun, it burns my eyes. When they paint your window black so you can't see out or throw the sign. And then when I stood there and you got no books to read. And then everybody around you screaming always because of, all of us are gangsters too. We got to be with ourselves. And if you don't know how to do nothing but be with you, you go crazy. And you start eating your shit, cutting your veins, screaming at the door. So if that's what you want and if you're not in the shoe, which is a lot safer because if you learn to be with yourself and you don't hurt yourself, you're pretty going to live. So they call that a shoe monster like me. I'd rather be in the shoe than in population. You know why? Because now you got 1,500 fucking fools you got to think for. You got 76% of those are murderers not going home. And they're good guys. But every so like three months, they all remember they're not going home. And then they look at a little sucker with a big mouth like you and me with 13 years saying he's King Tone. And he runs the world and blah, blah, blah. They say, you know what, King Tone? Let's see if you want to get life because I got it. I'm going to try your little ball-legged, fat, walking ass and see if you that gangster you put up. So every day is a scared day. Because the first gangster usually became a gangster the day he was the scaredest. 
When I went and got my gun, it's because I was scared. Not because I was brave. When I went to jail and I put my first one and did my first cut, it wasn't because I was brave. It's because I was scared of him. So I got him before he got me. Fear. A gangster's paradise. Fear. So that's what you do in jail. You scared now, like a man, don't mean you're Trump, but we learn to live with what? That fear every day that 1,500 of us now captured, don't have no way out. Some of us don't got money. Some of us, the family left us for dead. And somebody in there has got to let me eat. If you're ready for that for 20 years, check it out. I'll give you my number. Mm. <laughs> you go do it by bed because I was scared every day as King Tone. I was scared in Rockers Island. But I faced my fear with violence. And it made me a monster. So now I learned to face my fear with compassion, with understanding, with courage that doesn't harm others, but moves, removes the fear from being something that causes me to what? To give my freedom away due to I'm scared of something when I could question, I could, I could investigate, I could ask the person, Yo, you scared me, bro. Why you beat? Why you jump me on Burger King line, bro? I just do. I just wanted a burger. Oh, I didn't even see you, shorty. All right, big dog. Communication. So what I'm teaching y'all is, I got rid of the pride. I started understanding that the people I feared look like me, talk like me, broke like me, in jail like me. So why should I feed off the fear? So why didn't I have this compassion and become King Tone in the feds? So there's few of me. And few of people like me in the whole federal penitentiary across the country who think like me. And that's why we're trying to build more credible messages in the feds so we can start training our guys who are coming home by who? The guys who ain't coming home. So then we give them a mission in life to save their own and bring them ready for big brothers that were like them who's going to be waiting for them at the gate. So if you are shorty and you think it's sweet in jail, hug them up. Tie them up, because you seem, listen, and I hate to see it, because you got to bring them up. Y'all love 6 9 and when he, he had to live up to the bill, like me or others, it ain't easy. That shit is scary. A lot of people tell. He ain't the only one. Yo, 30 people tall on me. None of them were GDs. None of them were vice lords. I ain't going to say, so what that mean? When you go to your case of the gang you love, Usually the ones that are sitting across from you are the guys you love. So think about that, man. Don't, you don't have to run out. I'm not saying curse them, but learn to think your way through those circles because it's like the Boy Scouts. Gangs is what we got in our neighborhoods. It shouldn't be forever. We should be able to grow up out of it like Peter Pan. It's a, it's a, it's a little phase we might go through as a kid. But if you're 65 and you're still out there with the dudes, bro, you got to talk to yourself, homie. You, you really got to talk to yourself, right? If you're not doing credible messenger, you ain't trying to intervene. And you really, you know, you got to, you got to, you got to write home to mom or something. So, so you know, you got to grow up one day. So after you, after your bid, how was it coming out into the real world after so many years? And what did you start doing? Well, you know, at that time, thank God, uh, during the Babid, I met I met a, a young lady who took interest in me. We got married, 2007, in a prison, and from there, I came to Virginia and I started a new life with her in 2009. And in 2009, in Virginia, I started building my credibility. I started killing animals on a farm. Nobody would hire me. Gang Intelligence hired, uh, got an apartment across the street from my house. She see me thrown down and took him from her into a precinct, put naked, and took him pictures of my body by 20 officers. She seen and knows about them going to the Walmarts and everybody and telling them that I've came to. And, and Virginia is a, is a different state. So they blackballed me from the writ. So my PO officer gave me a job killing animals for $75. By hand, I was killing cows freaking sheep and all that. And I really was like, God, man, this is, 
this is it. <laughs> this is what it's come to. But he said, don't worry, I'm building you up, son. So from there, I, I took a church and uh, in Smoketown Road in Virginia, and it went from kindergarten to college. It had about $3,000, 3,000 members. And I went as a maintenance man who didn't know shit. And in six months, I became the manager of Hampy's Inn. And, and I stood there three years, and then I got myself secured. And, and, I, and, and I showed my partner that I was valuable and that I'm in the game now in 2013. I packed up from Virginia and went to New York because I had to go back and say sorry. And I had to go back. And she was crazy enough to come with me. And uh, there I went and I met my people. And that's when I started opening programs. I worked for CCI in this place called CCA. I started two different programs, one in East New York where I grew up for a year. Then I opened one in, New in Newark, New Jersey. And then in 2013, after the community and everybody see me, my fruit, and my brothers and sisters see me, and I practice what I told them I would come back to do, not to what everybody expected me to do. It disappointed some people that I chose activism and movement instead of going back to leadership and helping them when that would have been the end of me and them. And it just wouldn't end well. I came back to Virginia, to DC, in 2015, and I opened up Grow Up, Grow Out, and I started doing my own programs with my partner, Clinton Lacey, and we now going national. But it was a hard road, bro. I still pay child support with the old, and they you don't know what the system did to make me quit believing that I could have I could have been something else, right? I'm King Tone, but I could have been Antonio Fernandez again. I could take my maiden name. I could have been the dude, the name, and the person my father wanted me to be. So I, I work hard. So that name is as valuable as Anto King Tone. That got street value. That shit don't pay the rent. That shit don't do none of that. Right. What Antonio Fernandez has done for himself and 12 other men returning citizens with three felonies or more, we are now the pedestal into violence. We are now got 72, we got 300 across the country. We're trying to reestablish and show America the returning citizen is the penicillin to this disease. We could train them, we could empower them and give them good paying jobs. 46, 56,000 a year. Come on! They could compete with the drug dealer. Yeah. They could pull up on shorty and say, I'm driving the same car that cocksucker driving and it's legal and i do it with tone and we got the bling bling uh, yes sir but we do it with credit this how you do it right <laughs> we don't buy it at the same time it took us patience and imagine when the do you fear coming back from hurting your child more now becomes the public safety and he's the credible messenger who brings them like i said to those outside influences again that they trust because Tony is saying, this is the right medicine. These guys will really help you get housing. These guys will really help you get your kids back. These guys will help you get an education. Your moms can really come here and we'll help her get the house right. And nobody's going to intrude, make you feel like you're losers. All of you are worth everything that we got. And we invest the money from the system back into providers that are grassroots. That's what I'm fucking talking about. Yes, sir. What What are your thoughts on the continued war on gangs? It's been going on since the '80s. Now we have a new, a new, uh, a new uh, gang that they're out there looking at. What, what do you think about that? Well, we were just screaming three months ago, refund the police. Now we're all screaming, crime is up, and the red meat, the gangs. Boy, that shit came quick, right? They, crime is up. Of course, if the cops stop doing their job because they mad because they had to sacrifice one of them and we scream and refund the police, how do numbers go up? You get a lot of gun shows going. You get them guys to drop off the guns in the neighborhoods. You get the dope free and you turn a blind eye to crime. And you're saying it's everything and everything, but it's you doing what you're doing. Same kids, same gang. That was there six months ago. All of a sudden, they're killing each other like rice and beans. And now what we're doing, we're thinking of ways to what? Have a war on crime. See, we had a war on drugs. 
We had a war on the freedom right movement. We have a war on gangs. Why don't they ever do a war against poverty of a misenfranchisement? Why don't they, instead of sending four dudes to space for 12 minutes for almost close to a billion dollars, and you go to the ghettos for half, you could do the whole East Coast and give us new schools, yeah. wear conditioners. Wouldn't you be more prideful as the boss of Amazon then giving 20 computers, then building schools. And then you don't got to tear down statues because then our kids will make new forefathers. The true founding fathers of the country will write education books that tells the truth of history. So then we'll build new statues of greater heroes who make this country red, brown, black, white again that those could take pride of who they were, not talking like they just gave everything up and became who they are, that the rubble we got is the rubble we created, is the one you gave us. Mm. And we're forced to build houses with that shit. So that's what I'm telling people. Invest in us, invest in credible messengers, invest in these grassroots, stop giving the money. Yo, they just gave billions of dollars to stop this street crime you hear you hear biden but they gave it to the same programs yeah that have been failing for fucking 20 years damn it and they don't give me shit and i'm proven to change lives and i've seen seven thousand niggas march with me why because they got to give it to those people that ain't really fixing problems ain't really doing the work. How is crime up if you just gave $200 million to providers in the streets of Chicago? What are they doing? Send them to me. I'll teach them. I got two more questions because I know it's getting late out there in the East Coast. Yeah, they get me because I'm mad as hell because I'm seeing all this crime and I'm seeing cop suckers saying they fixing it, driving fences, and ain't shit happening. Let's switch this one up real quick. What's up now with the snitch generation? Six nine is a perfect example. It seems like it's prevalent everywhere. I'm, you're the perfect guy to ask. Is the G code dead? Is snitching a norm now? Snitching was the snitching campaign was created by the DA's office. Okay, that's not a that's not a gangster G code snitching. First of all. Grandma don't snitch, my sister don't snitch, a rape child don't snitch, my uncle don't snitch. If they don't carry a gun, if they ain't selling drugs, and you put that shit in front of their porch, and you force them to tolerate that shit in front of their kids, and he ain't gonna fight a gang, he gonna call the cops, he's a citizen, dummy. You're the snitch, cause you're doing it where everybody see you. And because you think you're so tough, you don't want nobody who see to tell the truth. So if you really don't want nobody to snitch on you, you don't let them see you. Snacks. So those are citizens protecting them, their property, their lives, their children from people who are doing things different. Now, if you get in the game and you're selling it out the back door, and you got your wife and kids in the other room and they raid your house and now you love your kids. You're gonna tell on the rest of the mob because you love your kids more than them. My point is we pay a lot of money for the DAs to do jobs. And I never seen Jesus when he got tempted three times in the desert, Jesus never shook hands with the devil. He never said, well, devil, if we do this and you tell, Jesus, just tell on it. Jesus said, look, I don't fuck with I don't bow down to idols. He kept it real. I'm going to pay what I came to do. I'm going to die on that cross. Get the fuck out of my face. That's my sentence. So now if you, you get in the game and you don't want to pay for what, look, snitches, as we see with 6 9 usually have a harder time turning over a new leaf like I did yeah. because they get taught 
that if you told, you changed, you did something good, which really was not. When you told, you helped the DA, the uneducated fool that works for a city, put people in jail with fibs and all kind of lies just because he made you what? Be scared of what you had to face like a man. Now that's a cooperator, that's a snitch. Let's make another thing clear. With all this snitchy shit, let's go do an investigation, see how many snitches dying across America. <laughs> snitches go right back to the block. They eat bread, they hang out, that shit is dead. So my point is, look at 6 9 he's live, he's living. So that kills that theory, snitches dying, and we got some have the misfortune after the DA uses them, they go, oh, we forgot to tell you, you still got to do 10 years. And you might run into some Latin kings. <laughs> or they send you back home and say, oh, we don't got money to hide you. So you're going to go right back to the block. So what I'm teaching the, the gang community, nothing's a secret no more. Your lessons, all that is on the page, is on the fam. We got gangsters on Facebook putting it all out there. Yeah. The only thing that's a secret is your stinking thinking. And the crimes you commit. So what I'm saying is stop putting it on the gram, stupid. Just like you put it on the gram, you put it in front of grandma's porch. Yeah. Just like you put it in front, you put it in the Chinaman store. And when they see you, they tell on you, stop snitching on yourself, sucker. Hmm. So if you don't want nobody to see, there you go. either stop doing it or do it in the dark. So stop bothering people and holding them to a standard they never made a deal or an oath to you about. They ain't joined the gang. So excuse them for, for keeping it like normal people. Think about what you did, like I did, that I let, see, let people see me do a drug transition. I didn't get mad at the snitches and the 130 people and the 30 people that told. I told on me. I put myself in that situation. I'm on that game board. And I took it, and thank God I could handle it. And I came home. And I have to worry about no cocksucker. Yeah, I'll say tones high. Everybody wants to say something. But my point is my heart, my soul said, you did the crime, do the time. Let the DA get who he wants and find out who did what with the FBI and the investigators that get paid a lot more than me telling. And half the time, you cocksuckers, you lie. You tell stories. You don't even tell the truth. Yeah. So that's what I think about snitching. It's a policy and a statement to keep another thing in our poor communities confused and fighting each other. So if the OGs would teach this, look, dude, if you're in the community doing shit, they see you. That's what people do. You got to get your game right. I'm just thinking the truth. You know what I mean? You're just lacing them up, man. So <laughs> last question for you, Tone. What is a true OG supposed to be doing in his hood? Well, if you're old and you're still living with mama and life been hard and you got nothing else, I got a good brother that that you know that just all his life struggled, and I know he's bankrupt, and he a good dude, and he teaches, and he love his hood, and he a good man. But life been hard. Nobody give him a chance. Nobody give him a job, and he tried. I seen him work all kind of jobs, but he doesn't hit that one, man. He doesn't hit, but he still keep preaching hope. And he doesn't let that despair make him hate his own again and be the bad example at 65. He lives in his mama's house with respect and then he gets his own and when he falls, but he shows, I'm never gonna be embarrassed because the woes I've lived to have put me here. I can still be a positive force. I can still talk about hope. And that's what an OG is supposed to do. He's supposed to talk about his scars. He's supposed to tell the two stories. When you're in jail, you don't run shit. You run everything to a CEO, say something. You fight your own Mexicans. You fight your own black brother until the white God says, sit down. <laughs> you see 62 dudes sit the fuck down. Drop the knives and let them take them. 
OJ is supposed to tell those stories. That most of the guys that need us in jail, if we have legal jobs, we can help our OGs better than selling dope. Because then they won't have to keep ruining lives to get the next man who support them. Because if we stay home all, we could always send money up there and they always be all right. And they don't got to send that despair out and only can make it up there by a misfit economy. If we start taking care of them with love and honor, like Barrios Unidos. And we bring the credible messages in the jail to teach the OJs in there. Don't send that hate out. That murder that happened with you 20 years old, don't tell your little nephew. Because then he's going to think you got to live up to it. Make the phone calls. More about, yo, shorty, don't come here. You see how hard it is. It's that, yo, you let them niggas down the worst. We up. That's what OG does. Other. I'm going to be oppressed, and then I'm going to press my uncle, my shorty, my son. Yo, I'm going to be leaned at this, right? You want to see something? My son is death, right? He's eight. I keep him away from everything. I went home today to look on the paper, and he had tone, B and G, Iron Man. I went to mother. Who told him my name was Tone? I don't show that to him. But somewhere my little smart man is put together that his daddy's something different. That Antonio name ain't who he is. And this is in the suburbs, in a better place. So if you think what you do won't reach your child and have effect on why he's gonna make a choice in the future, you a dirty motherfucker. So as soon as I seen that, I said, whoa, I gotta work harder. Cause he's gonna learn about King Tone but I also want him to see the other half of my life, grow up, grow out, saving people, being a good OG. So when he makes that choice, he chooses what I chose after, freedom. Not a bondage to something if it ain't leading him to freedom. And that's what OG should lead their shorties to, to freedom, not a life of imprisonment. Man, uh, this was... A great, great podcast. The message you should out there, Tone Man. I that's why I've been looking for you for so long. I just want to thank you so much, Armando, for coming on, man. Much love from the West Coast, player. Love you, Alex. You already know. Grow up, grow out. Credible messengers healing your community. Save space for power groups and free the homeland, Puerto Rico, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> ah, shit. All right, let me see.